everyone! Welcome to episode number 584 of this here electronic engineering podcast called Amelia's Weekly Fish Fry. Brought to you by eejournal.com and written, produced, and hosted by me, Amelia Dalton. Let's talk about hybrid processors. My guest this week is Aaron Frank from Curtis Wright, and we're delving into the world of hybrid processors and why a new processing approach is more important now than ever before. All right, so without further ado, please welcome Aaron to Fish Fry. Hi, Aaron. Thank you so much for joining me. Great to be here. Thank you. So we're talking about hybrid processors for today's multitasking world. But before we talk more in depth about hybrid processors, Aaron, what has changed when it comes to processors for embedded systems? A new approach is needed for the increasing amount of multitasking, right? Amelia, I think you've identified what I found to be perhaps the most fascinating aspect of my research into this entire area, and that is the word multitasking. It's not a new word. It's not a new concept. And in fact, operating systems have been doing multitasking for decades and quite well, I would add. What was eye-opening for me was just the sheer number of tasks that make up today's multitasking. In the early years of multitasking, you know, the number of tasks were reasonably small and you could pretty easily map these tasks into the things that you knew your computer system was doing. But if you think of Today, for example, data centers with server-class computers, you can expect them to be doing heavily loaded multitasking with things like virtualization and servicing a large number of clients. Now, what truly shocked me was when I was looking into my simple Windows PC, which is nothing complicated. It's a corporate laptop running maybe three or four applications, such as email or messaging and a Microsoft Word. When I looked under the hood, that simple setup was running 229 processes and over 3,000 threads. And that just blew me away. What that really tells me is that today's processing systems are doing a whole lot more, many, many more things in the background. And while, you know, this is a corporate laptop, you know, your phone that's in your pocket is similarly running hundreds of processes and tasks while it, you know, reaches out into the world to update your email, check your social media feeds, check for application updates, look for uh, Wi-Fi hotspots, and listen to you to call its name and you'll give it a Siri command. So let's talk about hybrid processors. Aaron, what are the biggest benefits when it comes to these kinds of architectures? Well, Amelia, I'd like to first set the stage by level setting everybody on what we mean by today's modern processors. You know, originally, processors could do just one thing at a time, and they created the illusion of multitasking by switching from task to task very quickly. Most modern processors are what's called multi-core processors, and that means they can actually process several tasks in parallel. Quad-core processor can run four tasks in parallel, and there are server-class processors with dozens or even hundreds of cores today. So in all of these processors, in general, a core is a core is a core, and all the cores are created the same. So a 16-core processor has 16 identical cores. Hybrid processors are built differently. Hybrid processors are also multi-core processors, but not all of the cores are the same. Okay, so how are these cores in a hybrid processor different? The most important difference here is that some of the cores are optimized for the highest possible performance. And these cores typically consume the most power and generate the most heat. Other cores are optimized for the highest possible processing efficiency, and they generally have reduced performance. But what's nice about those is they have significantly reduced power consumption and much less heat generated. Okay, so why is this so important, Aaron? Well, I'll bet every one of your listeners has a cell phone. And one of the most important selling features of a phone is, as you know, battery life. You want that phone to last all day without that dreaded low battery icon calling your name. Today's cell phones are capable of doing just about everything that a laptop computer can do. 
And it's also reaching out into the world and updating your email and monitoring your social media feeds and looking for Wi-Fi hotspots and more. So in this example, it's absolutely critical that the tasks consume very little power and they operate as efficiently as possible because these background activities do not have to operate in what I call strict real time. They're in the background. So performance is not nearly as important as power savings. On the flip side, you might be streaming a high definition video and watching something on your phone and perhaps mirroring your phone onto a big screen TV. For applications such as this, performance is much more important than power saving because nobody wants a jittery or a start stop video feed. What's nice about hybrid core processors is that it gives the software developers the flexibility to better tune a system for either performance or for power savings or some mix of both. On the technical side, a high performance core takes up more silicon space. So there is usually not too many of these high performance cores in a processor. But a reduced performance core is much smaller, which means the folks who make processes can put more of these reduced performance cores on the silicon. And the net result is that processors with higher core counts can actually do more things more efficiently. ARM processors, as a good example, they have been using hybrid processors for over 10 years with what they call big cores that do all of the heavy lifting of performance and little cores, which are the higher efficiency, lower performance processing. And if you have an iPhone, for example, since iPhone 7, all iPhones are benefiting from these hybrid core processors with a much better battery life. So, Aaron, what's new in this world of hybrid processors? I'm glad you asked. What's new is that Intel, who pretty much owns the lion's share of, I would say, mainstream consumer processors, that being the folks who run Microsoft Windows, Intel has recently adopted this hybrid processor approach. Now, Curtis Wright, being a leader in embedded processing technology, one of the areas that I'm involved in is bringing these commercial technologies into the aerospace and defense industry. And like most industries, especially embedded, we're always trying to reduce that power consumption without compromising performance. So as we bring these new Intel hybrid processors to the industry, I'm simply signaling the wake-up call primarily to our software developers and our systems designers that they might need to think of new ways to manage what they're doing in order to take advantage of these exciting new technologies in hybrid processors. Okay, so Aaron, you wrote a white paper about this subject, right? So what were the biggest takeaways that you observed from your research? As I mentioned earlier, the sheer number of what I would call non-critical, lower-priority processing tasks, it really blew my mind. All these background tasks are actually stealing performance away from what I might be doing in the foreground. And whether that's loading up a spreadsheet or running a Teams meeting, those things might need real-time audio and video. So what I found was... My old laptop, as an example, was a quad-core Intel processor, which means I could do four things at once. And my new laptop, which is a 14-core hybrid processor, I thought I could do, you know, three or four times things. Things would go three or four times faster. And while I found it more responsive and it has far superior battery life, more cores does not always mean directly proportional that much faster. Okay, so... Aaron, what does Curtis Wright offer when it comes to hybrid processor solutions? Curtis Wright recently announced the industry's first Intel hybrid core processor specifically designed to meet the needs of the aerospace and the defense industry. This is a VPX processing module called the VPX31262, and it incorporates Intel's 13th generation Raptor Lake 14 core hybrid processor. And with that, it also fits in with what we call our Fabric 100, 100 gigabit connectivity for fast processing. Now, given the environment we designed into, and that is developing extremely rugged and reliable processing systems that have to work flawlessly every time, we have the expertise to design these systems to work across temperature extremes in the most you know, demanding shock and vibration imaginable. We also work with our partners and our customers who are developing applications ranging from communications and surveillance systems to radar processors. And what I'm really saying is that there's a call to action here to start thinking about how the software developers can use hybrid processors more effectively. 
Okay. So Aaron, what do you think the future of hybrid processing will look like? You know, some technologies that we see come and go, they're fads, but some of them have, I think, lasting staying power. I don't think the world of multitasking is going to go away. And if anything, it's been getting more and more complex. So I believe that hybrid processing is here to stay. In the the fairly near term, you can expect to see, I think, a very quick jump in the number of cores in a processor. Now, for example, the consumer world has seen a pretty well flat core count for many years, the quad core processor being the status quo. And rarely would you see anything beyond a quad core. But if you look today, you'll see an immediate jump to 14 and 16 core processors on the market. I think the call to action is that a jump to a 14 or 16 core processor doesn't mean it's four times more than a quad core processor. All the cores do different things. So most often, about half the cores today are geared for performance and the other half for efficiency. If I look you know, further in the future, I think we're going to see significantly higher core count processors operating on what I call reasonable power consumption levels. Imagine a 64-core laptop that had battery life that could still last a whole day. That's something I would certainly appreciate when I'm on my next flight. For sure. All right, Aaron, it is time for your off-the-cuff question. So if you could have one meal right now, it doesn't matter if it's on the other side of the world, you need a passport to get there, what would you have? Oh, that's so funny. I recently have got on a very plant-based, I'm going to say a low-carb diet. So if I could have any meal right now, it would be a monster-sized plate of heavily loaded nachos. That would just make my day. (laughs) It could be from a local tavern. I don't care. That's my go-to in the next hour. (laughs) I love it. Well, Aaron, I think that's all I have time for today. Thank you so much for joining me. Amelia, thank you very much. Pleasure to be here with you. If you want even more information about Curtis Wright, hybrid processing, or to check out a recent interview with David Jednak from Curtis Wright about the expansion of Vita standards, I've included a couple links below the player on this week's fish frying page on eejournal.com and in the description for this week's YouTube episode as well. Hey, have you checked out EE Journal on social media yet? Well, you should. You can find us at facebook.com slash EE Journal. If you're into X, you can monitor our tweets at EE Journal TFM. And don't forget, if you would like to follow my personal account, check out Amelia D. 1978. And hey, if LinkedIn is more your thing, I dig it. You can follow us or me on LinkedIn as well. And we are now on Blue Sky Social and Mastodon too. And we have a YouTube channel, youtube.com slash eejournal. Folks, it is chock full of all kinds of techie videos, including our very popular Chalk Talk webcast series hosted by me. And, of course, you can subscribe to our EE Journal YouTube channel as well. Also, make sure you subscribe to this here podcast on Spotify, Podbean, Apple Podcasts, or just about any other podcasting platform to listen to some exciting upcoming episodes. Thank you, everyone, for tuning in. If you know of any cool new technology or heck you just want to chat, shoot me a line at Amelia, that's A-M-E-L-I-A, at eejournal.com, or post a comment on our forums on EE Journal. For the week of May 31st, 2024, I'm Amelia Dalton, and you've been fried. <laughs>